Today we're starting a new and exciting topic, transistors. So transistors, uh, a few introductory statements before we actually get started. Uh, transistors are very important. They are in basically all commercial electronics. Uh, computers totally rely on them. Uh, things like power supplies or amplifiers or uh, really anything else is going to have you know, transistor components uh, in them. Uh, transistors are mass produced, and I mean this, they are, they are the most mass produced thing in history. Um, if you compare like the number of transistors that have been made uh, since they were invented in, you know, the, the late 40s um, to the number of grains of rice that have been harvested since humanity started agriculture, um, transistors win very easily. Uh, there are lots of transistors made and the number is certainly only increasing every day. Uh, transistors are also very well studied. So if you, uh, if you were an electrical engineer or if you're at a school with an electrical engineering program, uh, you will almost certainly take, you know, a class or multiple classes just in transistors, maybe transistor design or transistor analysis. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a serious deal in electrical engineering because, because people have to get really good at making them and understanding how to measure them to see if you're making them correctly. Okay, so the transistors we're gonna be focusing on in Physics 315 are just one flavor of transistors uh, called bipolar junction transistors. Uh, and so just in contrast, so bipolar junction transistors, uh, their, their construction is with, so our, our diodes, remember, are a, are a P-type piece of silicon next to an N-type piece of silicon. Transistors are like uh, three little regions next to each other. It can be N, P, and N, or it can be P, N, and P. Um, but these, these refer to the, the different you know, chemical treatments of those, those pieces of silicon. We don't need to worry about their construction, except the, <laughs> um, whether, whether the transistor is made from NPN or PNP that determines the uh, the polarity of the transistor. Those are like two different flavors of transistors. So um, so be, <laughs> the rules for analysis are slightly different. There are some minus signs that get um, flipped between those two. So just to keep things easy in this class, we're going to be dealing exclusively with NPN transistors. Uh, if you want to, once we've learned about transistors in this class, if you want to apply what you know to PNP transistors, you can just look up a couple of rules about what what things change online or ask me. Um, and it's, you know, you can still analyze the, the PNP transistors. It's just, yeah, slightly different. So let's, uh, let's look at what our transistor connections look like. So our transistors are our first three terminal device. And transistors are all at least three, three terminals. So this means, you know, unlike a diode that has, you know, two connections to it or a resistor, which has two connections to it, a transistor has three connections to it, which is going to make analysis um, definitely more complicated than, than it is for our, for our two terminal devices. Okay, so an NPN flavor bipolar junction transistor uh, has a symbol that looks like this, and we'll write the symbol and then we'll um, learn some rules for analyzing it. So these are our uh, three connections to the transistor. Sometimes this is drawn in a circle, sometimes it's not, um, but the, the terminals are labeled like this. I guess I should give myself a little more room. So this terminal is called the base. Uh, this is the collector, and this is the emitter. Um, so this is, like I said, this is an NPN transistor, uh, just in case you see them. PNP transistors uh, are similar looking, but the uh, arrow is in a slightly different place and pointing in a different direction. So here for our PNP transistor, this is the base, uh, this is the emitter, 
and this is the collector. So anyway, this is the last time I'll mention PNP transistors, but um, if you're looking at a circuit diagram and you're trying to remember which one is which, uh, you can tell by this arrow, the, the emitter arrow, and for an NPN transistor, that arrow is, this is dumb, but it works, that arrow is not pointing in NPN uh, because it's like pointing out away from the base. For the PNP, it is pointing in. Okay. <laughs> all right, that's all we need to know about PNP transistors. Okay, so here's our NPN transistor. This is what we're gonna be studying. Um, so we're gonna be using references to the base collector and emitter, so we are gonna abbreviate these, um, you know, B, C, and E um, uh, a lot, because that's gonna be very convenient. So uh, let's define some other quantities that are gonna be that are gonna be useful. So I'll erase these words to give us a little more room. So we have E, B, and C. Each of these terminals can have a current flowing through it. Um, because of how these are typically used, the current directions are defined like this. And again, you know, you could define them a different way, but you're gonna end up with some minus signs. So I, I recommend sticking with this convention. Uh, so the base current goes into the base, the collector current goes into the collector, and the emitter current comes out of the emitter. Okay, so we can also write some uh, some voltages. So we can talk about the voltage at these points, or really, whenever we're talking about a voltage at a point, we're talking about the difference between that voltage and ground. So V, VB, the voltage at the base, or VC, or VE, the voltage at the collector or the emitter, these are, um, these are the voltages relative to ground. We can also talk about the voltage drops between these different terminals, and the most common ones are gonna be uh, VBE and VCE. So these are the voltage drops between these points. So for example, VBE is just equal to VB minus VE, and VCE equals VC minus, uh, minus VE. So yeah, these are, these are um, convenient. Uh, the, last, the last thing we'll talk about is, and this, this shows up lots of places other than transistor circuits because it has become convention. Um, so sometimes you see voltages written like this, VCC or VEE. -E. So when, when, the, when the transistor terminal is doubled like this, this means this is a power supply voltage associated with that end of the transistor. So for example, VCC is the voltage of the collector power supply. I am less likely to use these. I'm more likely just to draw a like plus five volts and connect it to the collector. But you see these a ton. And in fact, because like I said, because these are so common, VCC is used as a, uh, as a, as a voltage source label, even in circuits with no transistors because it has just stuck. So anyway, um, that's what, that's what you mean if you see these. We are, we're probably not going to need to use those so much, but it's, you know, it's good to recognize them. These we are going to use a ton and, as well as the currents. Okay, great. So let's see, what else do we need to know? One other thing we can use uh, just real quickly is Kirchhoff's current law. So our transistor conserves charge just like everything else in the universe. So we put current in the base and current in the collector. That same amount of current has to come out the emitter. Or in other words, you know, it's like doing Kirchhoff's law with this whole thing as a as a node, right? The current into that node equals the current out of the node. So IB plus IC is equal to IE. And that's just, like I said, conservation of current. Um, it is often the case, as we will see, that the base current is much smaller than either of those two. So if the base current is small, then the collector current is approximately equal 
to the emitter current, and that's going to be a useful approximation for us to make um, once we once we start analyzing these things. Okay, so we've defined some variables. Now, what the heck is going on with transistors? Like, what <laughs> what is this? What is it doing? Okay, so we can think of our transistor as a switch between points C and E, between the collector and the emitter, that opens or closes depending on what's happening at the base. So the base is like controlling this switch that connects the collector and the emitter, and that switch can be open, or that switch can be closed, and the base can be used to control, to control that current. That's the very um, cartoony, simple, <laughs> simple picture. Um, so to analyze this, kind of like how our diodes can be on or off, uh, our transistors can be in one of three different states. Uh, we'll write this over here. So our different transistor states are the following. Our transistor can be in cutoff, uh, which means that our collector emitter connection is like an open switch. There's no current flowing from the collector to the emitter. Uh, it can also be in saturation, where our collector emitter is like a closed switch. And we're gonna, you know, we have some more rules to add to these, but I just want to kind of paint a picture. Uh, and we have active mode, where our collector emitter behavior depends very sensitively on what's happening at the base. Okay, so. Uh, Let's erase this and redraw it over there. Now let's talk about active mode more just, just for just a second. So when we're in active mode, uh, this sensitive dependence looks like this. The collector current, the, the current going in the collector, is equal to the base current times some factor beta. So beta is the current gain of the transistor. So in other words, beta is some, you know, some number bigger than one, typically around 100 for uh, common transistors, maybe you know, 80 to 150 or something like that. Um, and so if you put a small current into the base when you're in active mode, that is going to ensure you get 100 times as much current flowing into the collector. And you can control that collector current by changing what the base current is. Um, so this is, what, uh, this is what allows a transistor to act like an amplifier. And that is, um, that is one you know, very important application of transistors by using a small signal to control a big signal, you can use them to turn, to turn small signals into big signals. Um, all right, so, so beta is a, a parameter that's associated with a, with a transistor. Um, beta is not a good, how can I phrase this? Beta is not like the resistance of a resistor or the capacitance of a capacitor. The resistance and the capacitance of those things those are things you can rely on, and those are good design parameters. Like, oh, I need a resistor that is 1.2 kilo ohms in my circuit right here. You do not, in general, get transistors with beta equals 100 exactly. And the reason is this value varies from specimen to specimen. Like in a box of identical transistors, you're going to get different values of beta. It also changes with temperature and things like that. Um, so in the, in the words of uh, the, the Horowitz and Hill Art Electronics textbook, uh, a circuit that depends on a particular value of beta is a poorly designed circuit. So you don't want to be relying on beta equals 100. You can rely on the fact that beta is going to be 
large and roughly in the in the neighborhood of a hundred, and we'll see how that can um, how that is enough to inform our our design decisions. Uh, beta is also sometimes called uh, H F E for transistor naming conventions. We don't really need to worry about. Um, so these are just two names for the same for the same thing. All right. So active mode is going to be important. We will uh, we will we will learn how to analyze a transistor in all three of these. But I figured I would um, mention that right away. Okay. So. Since we mentioned uh, Horowitz and Hill, I want to show you their cartoon model of how a transistor works, given what we know about active mode. So this is the um, Horowitz and Hill Transistor Man cartoon. And, you know, serious electrical engineers will roll their eyes at this, but I think for, a, for an intro class where we're only learning about uh, bipolar junction transistors. I think this is a pretty. Um, I think this is pretty helpful. Okay, so this is this is the inside of a of our bipolar junction transistor. We have our base connection over here. We have our emitter connection over here. We have our collector connection over here, and the inside of our transistor we are going to pretend looks like this. So our, um, our, oh yeah, there's one thing I'm missing. Our rule about active mode. Okay, so this is our transistor man cartoon. The inside of our transistor looks like this. We have a little meter for the base current and a little meter for the collector current that tells us, you know, how many amps are flowing through those. There is a diode uh, connected here between the base and the emitter. This really only matters because we're going to get a 0.7 volt drop like we've like we've seen in diodes before. And we have a little man trapped inside the transistor who is trying to keep this transistor in active mode. He is trying to make this true. He has IC equals beta IB on his mind and so he is looking at these two current meters and trying to adjust this variable resistor so that this is true. So he can increase this resistance between the collector and the emitter, um, or, or decrease it, <laughs> depending, to try, to try to keep this true. Now, he won't always be able to, but he is going to do his darndest. I guess I should show the direction of current. So our collector current is going in this way, our base current is going in this way, and our emitter current is going out that way. This is, you know, these are these are the same current directions that we um, that we talked about before. Okay, so uh, if if this little transistor transistor man is able to do this, he's able to keep this equation true by adjusting this resistance. Uh, the transistor is in active mode. And for some tiny change in the base current, he's going to adjust this resistance, you know, maybe a lot to get more or less collector current flowing through there. Uh, if the base current gets, you know, for, for example, let's say the base current gets bigger or bigger. So this current is getting bigger or bigger. So he needs to make the collector current bigger and bigger. He's going to make this resistance smaller and smaller, but eventually he might run out of resistance. So in other words, if the base current is too high, so that the collector current cannot stay a factor of beta above that because of whatever's going on upstream here, uh, that is when we are in saturation mode. So CE is like a closed switch. He's made his resistance as small as it can go. He's letting all the current through he can, and, and that is it. We are, we are saturated. In uh, cutoff mode, so if beta is, is you know, getting smaller and smaller, so he's turning the collector current down and down. Uh, if the base current turns off, he is going to stop the collector current, so he's going to, you know, disconnect his little resistor switch and not let any current flow between the collector and the emitter, so our, our collector-emitter circuit is like an open switch. Okay, so 
<laughs> Hopefully this cartoon is useful. Uh, in the next video, we're going to talk about specific rules for these three, for these three different modes and, um, and how to analyze them.